I'm Chris Fowler, and welcome as ESPN presents College Football's Greatest Games. Now, for the next hour, we're going to look back in time across the gridirons of America to feature some of the game's most thrilling moments. You'll see classic comebacks, amazing performances, and last-second heroics, all wonderful parts of the color and pageantry that is college football. And what better place to host this show than from Miami's Orange Bowl, a stadium that showcased some truly classic games. I know most of you have your own picks for the greatest games. I know I do. The question is, how do you select the all-time classics? Well, we've decided to use the following criteria to come up with our top 10 picks. First, the game had to be meaningful for a national title, conference championship, even part of a heated rivalry. Second, we looked at amazing comebacks, unbelievable upsets, even spectacular individual performances. Well, to sift through the hundreds of possible candidates, we sent over 300 surveys to college coaches, broadcasters, sports writers, schools, and historians of the game in an effort to select the top 10 games of all time. I'll tell you what, you may just be surprised by some of the results. So pull up a chair, sit back, and get ready to relive some magic moments as ESPN presents College Football's Greatest Game. Game number 10 on our all-time list was played in 1968. Now, this contest didn't feature any of the country's traditional football powers. There were no Heisman hopefuls involved. As a matter of fact, many of you may wonder how these two teams ever made the list. Well, it was simply a game between two of college football's oldest rivals, a game that featured one of the most stunning comebacks in history. You've got to see it to believe it. November 23, 1968. It's the 85th meeting between Harvard and Yale in what is simply known as the game. The two teams enter the season finale 8-0 with the Ivy League title on the line. It is the first time in 59 years that both Harvard and Yale are undefeated going into the season-ending showdown. An Ivy League game? Believe me, it is one of the great games in the history of college football. Yale was supposed to win, and in the fourth quarter, when the game was 29-13 Yale, all the Yale alumni were starting to celebrate. Yale alumni celebrate not with beer, but with champagne. That's the difference between the Big Ten and the Ivy League, but that's another story. So here it is in the fourth quarter, 29-13, virtually impossible for Yale to lose or even tie this game. Announcer Don Gillis takes us back to the final 73 seconds. Campy, back to throw. Looks for the corner. And it is to Bruce Freeman. Touchdown! The two-point conversion cuts the lead to eight with 42 seconds to play. Onside kick. Who's going to get it? Scramble. Who's going to have it? Harvard has it. Back. Just Krim up the middle. Krim to the 10. Krim to the 6-yard line. Coming up. A hush. He looks. He's the time. He wants to throw. He's still back. Time has run out. He throws. Touchdown! Dick Gatto! Dick Gatto! And the score is 29 27. Champy. The next day, the headline of the Harvard Crimson read, Harvard beats Yale 29-29. You know, one of the criteria for selecting our top 10 games had to do with amazing plays. Well, our next game has no competition when it comes to the word unbelievable. It featured two schools who have faced each other for almost 100 years. 
They call it the big game, and they play it for the act. In 1982, college football gained two new words that would become synonymous with our number nine rated game. They call it the play. It's a crisp and clear afternoon on November 20th, 1982, as Stanford meets Cal in the 85th annual big game. This series has produced more cliffhangers than any other NCAA rivalry. Dating back nearly a century, 44 big games have been decided by one touchdown or less. So it's only natural that John Elway and Stanford trail 1917 with only a minute to play. Faced with a desperate fourth and 17 situation, Elway goes back to pass for what could be the last play of his college career. Rose for Harry, it's complete. Hold everything. Elway's remarkable pass keeps the drive alive, putting Stanford in a position to win the game. With four seconds to play, kicker Mark Harmon lines up for a potential game-winning 35-yard field goal. It is good! Oh, look out! The Stanford players, fans, and band erupt. The Cardinal have pulled off an amazing comeback. All they have to do is squid kick the ball and run out the final four seconds. But then again, this is the big game where anything is possible. You know, the odds of something happening with four seconds left on a kickoff, especially the kind of kickoff they were attempting to do, which is just a squib kick, uh, the odds weren't that good. I just went straight on the field and lined up in my position, and I noticed that we were missing a guy, so I just moved over, and uh, when he kicked it, it happened to just come right to me. Cal announcer Joe Starkey calls the game's final play along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rogers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. Oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go in the end zone. He's going to go in the end zone. Will it count? Everybody's coming around on the field. The Bears! The Bears have won! The Bears have won! Oh, my God! The most amazing... Sensational, dramatic, heart-rending, exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football. California has won the big game over Stanford. Oh, excuse me for my voice, but I have never, never seen anything like it. For California, for California through and through. Let's go back to 1987 for the spectacular finish of the Division I AA Southland Conference matchup between Northeast Louisiana and Northwestern State. Northwestern State, wearing the purple uniforms, leads 31-27 with just 16 seconds left. Northeast Louisiana has the ball at its own 13-yard line. This pass by quarterback Stan Humphreys gains 39 yards to give the Indians one last desperate chance. Humphreys will put it up in the air for the goal line. The pass down there is batted up in the air. It's going to be up and loose. Oh, it's a touchdown! It's a touchdown! The Indians caught the football! It's a touchdown! It's a touchdown for Northeast! Humphreys' Hail Mary pass is tipped not once, not twice, but a total of four times before Jackie Harris makes the game-winning catch. Incredibly, the Indians win it 33-31. It would go on to capture the 1987 Division I AA National Championship. Just like with some other major rivalries across the country, whenever our next two teams get together, you're bound to get a classic battle. But in 1967, there was much more riding on this game than just crosstown bragging rights. At stake was the city championship, Pac-8 title, the Rose Bowl berth, and a possible national championship. And on a personal level, the Heisman Trophy. Here's a look back at our eighth greatest game of all time. 1967 is an exceptional year for college football in Southern California. The UCLA Bruins are 7-0-1 and ranked number one in the country, led by their Heisman Trophy candidate, quarterback Gary Beban. Their crosstown rivals, the USC Trojans, are 8-1, ranked number three, and have their own Heisman Trophy candidate in tailback O.J. Simpson. Some sports writers hype this game as the arm versus the leg. The juice gives SC a 14-7 lead with this bruising run. 
Jay's greatness is clearly evident on the play as he breaks a total of six UCLA tackles for the score. Gary Beban counters by tossing this 53-yard bomb as UCLA goes on to build a 20-14 lead. Trailing by six points late in the game, USC coach John McKay puts in Simpson to return the kickoff, which he almost breaks. We came out of the huddle, and I was standing there, and, the, and I heard him go red. Red mean, meant hot, meant it's an audible. The next play is going to be the play 23, which shocked me because, one, I, I was tired, and two, I didn't think it was a good call for third and six or seven. With time running out and the game on the line, USC turns to O.J. Simpson to save the day. He's on his feet and running down across the 50. He's to the 40. He's to the 30. Nobody's going to catch him. He has blockers alongside. When the ball was snapped, the hole opened up beautifully, and I remember hopping in there to make sure I got the first down. And then it was just a matter of trying to weave my way downfield, and I cut back, and it was a foot race to the end zone. And with Ricky Aldridge's PAT, uh, we won the game 21-20, and it's, to me, it's the greatest game I'd ever played in, and it's still, you know, my favorite. Game number seven on our list should have been called the Ice Bowl. With the wind chill factor, temperatures on the field of the 1979 Cotton Bowl dipped to a frigid minus six degrees. Winds were up to 20 miles per hour. It seemed because of these terrible conditions that the first ever meeting between our next two schools would come down to whoever scored, period. No one could have imagined at kickoff that this Cotton Bowl classic would be just that, a classic featuring a player known for his last second heroics. January 1st, 1979, the 43rd annual Cotton Bowl provides an unlikely player, Mother Nature. Freezing temperatures and gusty winds make it the worst conditions in the storied history of this bowl classic. But even the elements can't dampen the spirit of this matchup between the Houston Cougars and their exciting beer offense and the Notre Dame Fighting Irish with their superstar quarterback, Joe Montana. Coach Dan Devine's Irish jump out to a 12-0 lead, taking advantage of a pair of Cougar fumbles. Just when it looks like Notre Dame can phone this score in, the momentum shifts, and shifts quickly. In a bad snap, the quarterback, Montana, tries to get the ball back. The Cougars recover. Houston's got the football. Houston runs off 34 straight points, and with 7.37 left in the game, the score is Cougars 34, Irish 12. Houston took a big lead. Joe Montana did not play well. In fact, they had to take him to the locker room. His body temperature was down. He came back. The, the weather was still cold. The weather was still miserable. But Joe Montana got hot. Notre Dame came back. What a way for Joe Montana to leave college football. The legend was only beginning. Newt Rockney must have been looking down upon the Cotton Bowl this icy day as the Irish stage one of the greatest comebacks in bowl history. First, they block a punt and turn it 33 yards for a touchdown. To the 25, to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, and into the end zone goes Steve Sinchi. A two-point conversion makes it 34-20. Joe Montana, who threw four interceptions on the day, directs Notre Dame 61 yards on five plays. Montana rolling out to the left side. He is on the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 6 points for Notre Dame. As Joe Montana scores, going around left hand on a spread out, having a 61 yard touchdown five play drive. And the score now is 34 to 26. Montana drops back, stands on the 10, runs to his left. He's on the 7, he throws into the end zone. It's complete to Haynes for 10 points. Chris Haynes over to the end zone of the score now. Notre Dame 28 and Houston 34. And Notre Dame has cut the Houston lead to only six points with 4.15 left in the game. With 28 seconds to play in the game, the Cougars are faced with a fourth and one on their own 29-yard line. Houston decides to roll the dice and go for it. They have two feet to go, and they're not in punt formation, and they hand it off, and they do not get the first down. As Emmett King tried the left side, he did not get the first down, and Notre Dame takes over with 28 seconds to go. 
trailing by six points with little time left, one of the game's greatest comeback players, Joe Montana, takes over. Montana calls the signals. He's dropping back. He looks toward the end zone. He throws it. It's a touchdown! It's a touchdown! Joe Eunice kicks the game-winning extra point as Notre Dame scores 23 points in the last seven and a half minutes to pull off one of college football's greatest comebacks. Here is 1947. Army, with an impressive unbeaten streak of 32 straight games, travels to Baker Field in New York to take on Columbia in what many feel should be win number 33. Predictably, the cadets power their way to impressive scores to take a 14-0 lead. Columbia coach Lou Little turns to his All-American end, Bill Swiacki, who makes a number of spectacular acrobatic catches to rally the Lions. Army coach Earl Blake is worried as Columbia pulls within 20 to 14. With time running out, Swiaki makes another diving catch to keep the Lions' drive alive. A three-yard touchdown run ties the game. Benson Yablonski's extra point makes it 21-20 as Columbia pulls off an incredible upset, snapping Army's unbeaten streak at 32 games. Our sixth greatest game of all time took place right here in the Orange Bowl. It was November 23, 1984, and the conditions were less than ideal. It was a wet and misty afternoon as a national audience tuned in the day after Thanksgiving to watch two of the nation's premier passers. But no one that night could have predicted the offensive explosion that took place. They went up and down this field, combining for 92 points. And no one could have written a more dramatic ending to a college football game. College football fans across the country tune in on November 23rd, 1984, to watch a matchup between two of the nation's premier quarterbacks, Miami's Bernie Kosar and Boston College's Doug Flutie. Damp and soggy conditions threaten to ground the expected aerial show as Miami coach Jimmy Johnson and Jack McNell of Boston College ponder their game plans. But it's business as usual for these two high-scoring teams. Flutie and Kozar light up the scoreboard in the first half. They combine for 49 points as the Eagles hold the edge at the break, 28-21. Like two heavyweight boxers trading blows, Miami and Boston College continue to battle back and forth in the second half. Kozar directs the Canes to a 31-28 lead in the third quarter. The Eagles defense hangs tough, intercepting two Kozar passes, this one by freshman linebacker Bill Romanowski. Both Miami turnovers result in Boston College field goals as the Eagles regain the lead 34-31. With under four minutes to play, BC is ahead 41-38. However, Kozar has the hot hand and the Hurricanes are driving. On second and goal from the one, running back Melvin Bratton takes it over the top, giving the Hurricanes the lead 45-41 with just 28 seconds left. However, Boston College isn't through yet. With six seconds to play, Doug Flutie still has one last chance. Here's how the Miami broadcasters called the game's final play. Wide to the right. Six seconds left to go in the game at the 48-yard line. Flutie is back. Four seconds, three seconds, two seconds, one second. This game is over. Hail Mary, deep it is. It is called for a touchdown. I don't believe it. Boston College has won. Now let's hear the Boston College version of Flutie's heroics. Takes the snap. He drops straight back. Has some time. Now he scrambles away from one hit. Look. Uncorks a deep one for the end zone. Phelan is down there. Oh, he got it. He got it. He got it. Touchdown. 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 Touchdown, Boston College. He did it. He did it. Flutie did it. He got Phelan to the end zone. Touchdown. I don't oh, my oh my goodness! What a play! Rudy to Gerard Phelan! 48 yards! No time on the clock! It's all over! It is over! Boston 
Yes. College has won this football game. When the dust settled, Flutie and Kozar passed for a combined 919 yards, five touchdown passes, and 1,282 yards of total offense. But these amazing statistics will always be overshadowed by one single play, a Hail Mary pass that will long be remembered as one of college football's greatest moments. The year is 1957. Bud Wilkinson's second-ranked Oklahoma Sooners are riding a 47-game winning streak as they play host to Notre Dame. No one expects the Irish to put up much of a fight since they're having an average year. The game is scoreless deep into the fourth quarter when, on a fourth and goal from the Sooner three-yard line, Notre Dame's Dick Lynch powers in for the score. The Irish, a 21-point underdog, leads 7-0. With only a minute remaining, the second-ranked Sooners desperately drive toward the Irish goal line. But Notre Dame intercepts Oklahoma's last-ditch pass to snap the Sooners' 47-game win streak, a streak that still stands in the record books today. On November 19, 1966, the two top-ranked undefeated teams in the country faced off what would become the national championship game. On one side of the ball, you had a team which led the nation in scoring at 37 points per game. On the other side of the pigskin, you had a school featuring superstars, Gene Washington and Bubba Smith. 80,000 fans packed the stadium that day, paying only $5 a ticket to see this clash of the titans in our fifth all-time game. The place, Spartan Stadium, on the campus of Michigan State University. Era Parsegian led his undefeated and number one ranked Fighting Irish against Duffy Doherty, second ranked and unbeaten Michigan State Spartans. Tickets for this battle have been sold out for weeks. At stake, the national championship. There was a lot of hype in that game. In fact, a lot of things went on. There was a church in Connecticut that changed the time for confession so the members of the church could watch the game on television. I wonder who they rooted for in that game. Well, it was a great game. Approximately 28 to 30 players in that game eventually played pro football. The Irish lead the nation in scoring offense at 38 points per game, as well as in points allowed, giving up only 3.5. The Spartans are ranked in the top 10 in three defensive categories and are led by 6'7", 280-pound lineman Bubba Smith. Jones in the backfield. Jimmy Ray, the quarterback. There's the snap. Ray goes back to pass. Plenty of time. Throws long downfield to Washington. And he's got it at the 30-yard line of Miller. Michigan State marches down the field late in the first quarter, scoring on a four-yard run by fullback Regis Cavender. A 47-yard field goal gives the Spartans a 10-0 lead. But the hobbled Irish fight back with a 34-yard touchdown pass. Back to pass goes O'Brien. He looks. He throws long. It's too flat, Joe, and it's a touchdown. Go to attempt at the 18-yard line. O'Brien will hold. Ball is snapped and spotted. It's up in the air. And it's good! And we have a brand new football game here at Spartan Stadium. On their own 30-yard line, Notre Dame plays it safe by keeping the ball on the ground. Fearing a turnover, Coach Parsegian decides to play for a tie. 10-10. Our quarterback was uh, knocked out in the first quarter. Uh, my great running back, Nick Eddy, was out uh, of the ball game as a result of shoulder injury. My center was lost in the first uh, quarter of the ball game. A countless number of injuries. So in my opinion, it was a, a great football game with great players and uh, a great comeback by Notre Dame. Notre Dame goes on to beat Southern California 51-0 the following week to win its first national championship since 1949. As for Michigan State, they must settle for second place. No time on the clock. This flashback the doesn't air. deal with a specific there. game. Instead, we're going to pay tribute to one of the most exciting bowls around, the Holiday Bowl. He caught him! He's he a down! Down! Wow. Oh, play flicker. It's at 
Concern, very few games can match the one you're about to see. In the 1940s, there were only two football powers in the land, Army and Notre Dame. In a three-year stretch in the mid-40s, these two teams lost a total of one game. So it was only natural that when these two superpowers met in 1946, many sports writers billed it the game of the century. As college football fans huddled around their radios that day, the cadet and Irish took center stage in what we call the fourth greatest game of all time. Game number four on our list takes place in 1946. It's Army versus Notre Dame, and many experts still call this the game of the century. Army, unbeaten and untied in 25 games, has been national champs for two years running and is looking for title number three. Notre Dame is also unbeaten and untied in 1946, as they set out to avenge two straight blowout losses to Army. Yankee Stadium is picked as a neutral site, and more than 74,000 fans fill it to capacity, including General Dwight Eisenhower. Army coach Earl Blake has his two weapons, Blanchard and Davis, primed and ready for action. While Irish coach Frank Leahy turns to his star, Johnny Lujak. You had maybe the greatest talent of college football players on the same field at the same time. Two Heisman Trophy winners from Army, Glenn Davis and Doc Blanchard, two Heisman Trophy winners from Notre Dame, Johnny Lujak and Leon Hart. They were scalping tickets for that particular game at Yankee Stadium for $200, which was an awful lot of money in 1946. It was supposedly going to be a very big offensive game. I mean, who was going to stop Blanchard and Davis? Uh, could they stop Lujak's passing? Uh, everybody expected a very, very big offensive game. Well, as it turned out, it could probably be best characterized as the game where the coaches wish that they had not disdained the field goal. From the beginning, this game lives up to all its hype. Josh Blanchard on the move against the rugged Notre Dame defense that smashes the brilliant back for a three-yard loss. Glenn Davis, cadet speedster, raises Army hopes as he spins for seven yards. The cadets are happy. It's Davis again trying an end sweep, but the fighting Irish turn him in and smear the play for a five-yard loss. Four yards from a touchdown as Bill Gompers tries to sweep in, but the cadets crush the scoring bid, stopping an Irish drive that covered 85 yards. It's a bruising battle. Blanchard turns for five yards. Vicious line play predominates. Army is forced to kick. Bill West punts, and it's fumbled near the goal line, but Johnny Lujak is Johnny on the spot, bobbing up to recover and save the day for the Irish. Notre Dame takes to the air in quest of a score. Johnny Lujak passes, but it's intercepted by Arnold Tucker. One of three pass interceptions by the cadet quarterback that stops potential Notre Dame touchdown. One of the day's great performers. Notre Dame tries a tricky reverse. Sitko goes 11 yards, stopped by Blanchard on a bone-crushing tackle. Blanchard carries, breaks into the open, but Lujak speeds in from the side with a game-saving tackle. The cadets drive one final time, but Tucker is stopped short as time runs out. The hard-fought battle ends in a 0-0 tie. The year was 1969. We landed on the moon. The Vietnam War protests were at their peak, and Richard Nixon was in the White House. 1969 also produced a classic college football game. Set against the backdrop of the Southwest Conference Championship, number one met number two in the final game of the season. Now, the game showcased an unstoppable wishbone offense versus the nation's top defense. Both teams were 9-0 as a sellout of 45,000 fans turned out to see the national championship game. It's also number three in our all-time list. December 6th, 1969, Razorback Stadium. 
The Texas-Arkansas game is originally scheduled as a mid-season matchup. But that spring, ABC Sports asked the schools to move the game to the end of the season in hopes that it would be for the national championship. It turns out to be a good move. The Texas Longhorns, 9-0 and ranked number one, arrive in Fayetteville as 13-point favorites to take on the number two and undefeated Arkansas Razorbacks. It's only the fourth time number one played number two at the end of the regular season. Obviously, there's a great deal riding in the outcome of this game, the national championship and the Southwest Conference title. As one local writer puts it, it's the most important battle in the Southwest since the Alamo. From the start, it's all Arkansas, as the Razorbacks force a turnover in the second play of the game. One minute later, they convert the Longhorn fumble into a touchdown to take a 7-0 lead. Texas can't get anything going as they turn the ball over again. Arkansas capitalizes and takes a 14-0 lead into the third quarter. However, Texas won't give up as they show why their offense is ranked first in the nation in rushing. Quarterback James Street breaks one 42 yards for the score. Gets away. There he goes. Texas. The Longhorns convert a two-point try to make it Arkansas 14, Texas 8. Late in the game, facing a fourth and three situation on their own 43-yard line, Coach Darrell Royal decides to take a gamble. We were totally confused all afternoon long with our offense. With time running out, inability to move the ball, uh, I came to the conclusion that we had to get something big and get it in a hurry. And going to go to Randy Peschel, and Peschel catches the ball. When Peschel goes up for the ball, there were six hands up there. Four of those hands belonged to Arkansas. Two of them belonged to Texas. Two plays later, Jim Bertelson goes in from the one-yard line. And with the extra point, the score is now Texas 15, Arkansas 14. The Razorbacks' desperation pass is intercepted as the Longhorns preserve the one-point victory. It's a gritty comeback, symbolized by Coach Royal's gutsy fourth down call late in the game. The dramatic win earns Texas the national championship. Let's travel back to 1963 to Pasadena, California for the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. The Pac-8 representative is the number one ranked USC Trojans. The Big Ten sends the number two ranked Wisconsin Badgers. The Trojans, behind their All-American quarterback Pete Bethard, play like national champions, cruising to an easy 42-14 lead going into the fourth quarter. Many of the 100,000 fans left the scene of this mugging when Wisconsin suddenly erupts. Quarterback Ron Vanderkellen goes wild, rallying Wisconsin to 23 straight points. He completes 33 of 48 passes for a record 401 yards. With a little more than a minute to play and trailing 42-37, Wisconsin's onside kick fails as USC escapes one of the greatest rallies in college football history. Our next all-time game took place right here at the Orange Bowl, January 2nd, 1984. That was supposed to be a mismatch, but it turned out to be a classic matchup between power and finesse. In a contest filled with drama, it came down to one final play, a two-point conversion. Make it, you win the national championship. Fail and finish a disappointing number two. Here's a look now at game number two on our all-time list. Some call the 50th Orange Bowl Classic the finest college bowl game ever played. The number one ranked Nebraska Cornhuskers, considered by some sports writers the greatest team ever, take on the powerful number four ranked Miami Hurricanes. Nebraska enters the game 12-0, while Miami is 10-1. With number two Texas and number three Alabama both lose New Year's Day, the Orange Bowl becomes the site for the national championship game. The Cornhuskers lead the nation in scoring and rushing offense, featuring Heisman Trophy winner Mike Rogier. 
everything seems in place for Nebraska coach Tom Osborne to have a storybook ending. All that stands in his way are Howard Schnellenberger's Miami Hurricanes, a 10 and a half point underdog. But this is the Orange Bowl, home to the Canes and their rifle arm quarterback, Bernie Kozar. The Hurricanes live up to their nickname in the first quarter as quarterback Bernie Kozar and company blow past the stunned Huskers for a 17-0 lead. In the second quarter, coach Tom Osborne dips into his bag of tricks. He calls for an intentional fumble. The fumble ruski and guard Dean Steinkuhler rambles 19 yards for a touchdown, pulling the Cornhuskers to within three points at halftime. The Hurricanes come out firing in the third quarter behind Kozar's pinpoint passing and Alonzo Highsmith's running to take another big lead at 31-17. But once again, Nebraska fights back with less than two minutes to play and down by seven, Turner Gill connects with dangerous Irving Fryer as the Cornhuskers move into Miami territory. Then with 48 seconds to play and faced with a fourth and eight, Nebraska back Jeff Smith takes a pitch and goes all the way for a touchdown to cut Miami's lead to one. Coach Osborne immediately decides to go for the two-point conversion and the win. Nebraska will go for two. Hill takes, looks, rolls, throws, deflected the way! If Nebraska gets a tie in that game, Nebraska wins the national title. Miami lost earlier in the year at Florida. Everybody would have voted Nebraska number one, except for maybe a few people from, say, Miami. As for Tom Osborne, I've often wondered how much he thinks about that game and going for the two points. It was a tough decision and a gutsy decision, but it probably cost Nebraska the national title, but still he went for the win and not the tie. This game had it all, high stakes drama, plenty of scoring, standout performances, trick plays, and controversy. In the end, Howard Schellenberger and his remarkable team were declared the national champions. The 1965 Orange Bowl features Texas versus Alabama. With retired coach Bud Wilkinson in the broadcast booth, the nation's spotlight shines on young Texas coach Darrell Royal and on Alabama's legendary coach Paul Bear Bryant. All-American quarterback Joe Namath leads the undefeated and number one ranked Crimson Tide against the underdog Longhorns in what is to be the first ever Orange Bowl played under the lights. Texas gets on the board first with Ernie Coy's spectacular 79-yard touchdown run. He's at the 30, the 20, the 10, and he's over! Next, the Longhorns go to the air with this 69-yard scoring strike to George South, giving Texas a 14-0 lead. Texas leads 21-7 before Joe Namath rallies the tide on this 20-yard touchdown pass to receiver Ray Perkins. Bama has a chance to win late in the game as Namath rallies the tide down to the Longhorn goal line. On a fourth and goal from the one, Namath keeps the ball and tries to punch it in. But Texas linebacker Tommy Nobis stops him inches short to preserve the 21-17 upset victory as the Longhorns capture the national championship. How big was our number one ranked game when it was played in 1971? Well, put it this way, many fans across the country rescheduled their Thanksgiving Day meals around kickoff. This matchup had everything you could ask for, number one versus number two. Heisman Trophy candidates, the nation's top ranked offense against the top ranked defense. Not to mention having the Big Eight title, a trip to the Orange Bowl, the national championship on the line. Let's look back in time now. Thanksgiving Day, 1971, and our top-ranked game. Thanksgiving, 1971. The stage is set for the nation's top two teams to square off. Bob Devaney's number one-ranked 10-0 Nebraska Cornhuskers travel to Norman, Oklahoma to take on Chuck Fairbanks' number two-ranked undefeated Sooners in the season finale. At stake, the Big 8 title, an Orange Bowl for the national championship, as well as Nebraska's 30-game unbeaten streak. Number one, Nebraska is led by quarterback Jerry Tangy and future Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Rogers. Number two, Oklahoma relies on the dazzling running of their superstar, Greg Pruitt. 
The game starts out with a bang as Johnny Rogers takes an Oklahoma punt at his 28-yard line and stuns the partisan Sooner crowd with an electrifying 72-yard touchdown run. And he is going down. Now. Oklahoma comes back as quarterback Jack Milderen spots John Harrison for a touchdown as the Sooners go out on top 17-14. This is the first time the Huskers are trailing at halftime all season long. Nebraska's fullback Jeff Kinney is close to unstoppable in the second half as the Cornhuskers roar back into the lead 28-17. In the fourth quarter, Oklahoma's defensive end Lucius Selman recovers a Nebraska fumble. Finding the ball, it's loose, and Oklahoma recovers. Lucius Selman recovers the ball. And there is the first opportunity to see the speed of Greg Pruitt. What a play, bud. Faced with a fourth and six situation with just seven minutes to play, Oklahoma quarterback Jack Mildred goes to the air as the Sooners regain the lead 31 28. Amazingly, it's the third lead change of the day. With the national title on the line, the Cornhuskers have only seven minutes left of the ball game. They start what some writers call the gutsiest drive in college football history. Of the 12 plays, Jeff Kinney carries the ball seven times. His final run is a two-yard touchdown, his fourth of the day, giving Nebraska a dramatic 35-31 victory. Rich, have you ever played in a more exciting game or a better game? Uh, this is the most exciting game I've ever played in. Well, you'll be back for another year of eligibility. We'll look forward to that. And Jerry, congratulations again and a great senior year. Thank you, Ms. Fine. Okay. All right, there they are, Rich Glover and Jerry Taggy, the defensive and offensive players of this game. When the dust settled, these two teams gained 829 yards and scored nine touchdowns. It is considered by many as the greatest college football game ever played. Now that we've showed you how our survey ranked the greatest games of all time, we thought it'd be appropriate to look at some classic matchups that didn't quite make our list. Who better to bring a different perspective to college football than our very own Beano Cook? Thanks, Chris. Here's a short list of many memorable games, at least to me. 1956, Tennessee and Georgia Tech. Tennessee 6, Georgia Tech nothing. Tennessee finished second in the country that year. It was the only game Georgia Tech lost. 1979 Sugar Bowl. Alabama won the national title over Penn State 14-7. Two things will always be remembered. The goal line stand by Alabama when Penn State had 12 players in the field when Alabama had to punt. You're only allowed to have 11. 1946, Army 21, Navy 18. After the game, somebody asked Tom Hamilton, the Navy coach, do you think of kicking a field goal? And he said, no, a tie is like kissing your sister. 1957, Ohio State shared the national title that year with Auburn, and they shared it by beating Iowa with a fourth quarter touchdown, 17-13. And also in 1940, one of the great games, Boston College 19, Georgetown 18, Frank Leahy was the coach to Boston College. In two years, he lost a total of two games. Then he went to Notre Dame. Back to you, Chris. All right, thanks, Bino. Well, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank all the schools and individuals who helped in paying tribute to college football's greatest games, as well as the fine folks here at the Orange Bowl. Before we go, let's take one last look at some truly magical moments. For everyone at ESPN, I'm Chris Fowler. See you next time.